Boom. We are live, everybody. So watch what you say. Chris Bick's in the house. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and introduce first Chris Rust, and I teach choir and music theory. And uh, this is my 16th year here. And we'll just go that way, Greg. Yeah, my name is Greg Hall, and I teach all of uh, the bands uh, at Sunset. Uh, Contra Band, which is a freshman band, uh, Symphonic Band, Jazz Lab, and Paul Marching Band, and Funk Band. Uh, and I've been here since school year 86, 87. All right. Aubrey? Okay. Um, I'm Aubrey Park, and then I am teaching IB, and then Art 1 and Art 2 as well. And I actually student taught um for the current ib teacher back in 2009 i think and then i taught at a different school and then came back so i've been teaching at sunset for i think my seventh year all right was that was that kathy did i already forget her name yeah love kathy, kathy. yeah she was great yeah. kathy. she was great all right james Hey, I'm James Farmer. I teach theater and film. This is my 13th year at Sunset. Um, I also direct the after school theater program and collaborate with Greg and Chris on the musical every year. All right, Mary. I'm Mary Tethon and I teach graphic design one, two, three, and four. And this is my 14th year at Sunset. And Ellie. Yeah, I'm like, um, well, obviously Sarah will be next, but with all of you have been at Sunset for so long, I'm like, gosh, I feel like I've been here forever, but not compared to <laughs> not compared to you all. This this is a good lineup. I'm Ellie Rosendahl, and I teach photography and um, also yearbook. And this is my ninth or tenth year at Sunset, somewhere in there. All right, ninth or tenth, somewhere. <laughs> we don't count. I actually even put that on my, we had to fill out our forms to our principal about our intentions for next year. And I put nine or 10 question mark. <laughs> I don't know. He came the same year as me. Yeah, that's great. All right. And Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah Whitley. I teach ceramics one and two and art one. And this is my third year at Sunset. Newbie. And uh, why don't we finish it out with the... Uh, with the goat, the greatest of all time, Chris Bick. Ooh, ooh, I'll never be able to live up to that one. Uh, good, every, good evening, everybody. My name is Chris Bick. I'm uh, an assistant principal at Sunset, and um, I have the distinguished good fortune of working with everyone who just introduced themselves. Uh, if you're an adult on screen joining us, if you think you've got a really, really good job, I know this is not a competition, but tonight I win. It's good to see you all. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So um, we'll go around real quick and, and just kind of give, I'd love it if we could just keep it to one to two minutes um, about our program, and then we'll kind of answer questions. And I'm going to go super quick because I have like a philosophy thing that's been on my mind that I want to stab at. So um, I teach choir and music theory and choir, if you're interested in it, no, you do not have to have a background in singing. That's the whole reason we take classes. You don't need to take calculus if you already know calculus. So you don't you don't you don't have to already know how to sing to be in choir. Um, and then music theory is more of an intro level class, and then IB music theory is uh, an advanced level. And I'm sure there will be some questions on that. I'm happy to answer. Um, for forecasting, it's really easy. There's just one choir class in the in the program planning guide. There there are currently four choir classes, but for forecasting, just forecast for choir. I do want to sneak in one quick little philosophy thing to to throw at, at all of you parents. And that's just that heavy on my mind recently is, is the emotional well-being of our students. And it is not good overall. I mean, I'll pull the students every two or three weeks and it's pretty rough. And uh, I just really believe in my core that our classes have a unique opportunity to speak to those needs of students even better than uh, or more easily and efficiently than than some of the other classes and um, you know I think we think of the the the, the one-off student that loves choir and loves band and that's their whole identity um, but lately I've been kind of just thinking about those students who choir isn't their identity but they need it 
because it's a place where they connect with other kids in, in a very unique way. Or yearbook isn't their thing, and yet they need yearbook. And I just, I do worry about these kids and I get, a, I field a lot of questions about IB and academics and well, can I take three science classes my senior year? And it's like, ooh, hang on there, buddy. We need, we need to speak to your whole core, okay? And science is part of that, but so are the arts. And I just really believe that to my core. And I, I'm worried about all of these kids from freshman to senior. So I'll get off my high horse. And uh, thanks so much for being here, everybody. All right, we'll jump over to Greg. If you wanna just say a few minutes about your... Sure, sure. Um, at our high school right now, we have um, contraband, which is a ninth grade um, class um, um, for, again, all of our ninth graders. And we have uh, for sophomores and uh, juniors and seniors, we have symphonic wind ensemble, kind of a multi-level uh, band class for our 10th through 12th graders. We also have um, our uh, jazz band at the school. All of these classes meet during the school day. And um, I am so thankful for that, uh, for our kids. Great opportunity for kids to learn just a plethora of different types of music. Uh, so again, uh, the ninth grade offering uh, concert band, and then we have symphonic wind ensemble for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. We also encourage um, all of our wind and percussion players the months of September and October to be involved in our um, Apollo Marching Band and Auxiliary concepts that are uh, involved in that after school experience really helped the kids sort of their potential the day during the concert band classes. And that's just especially for new kids who are new to our campus. Our school is so large and becoming uh, involved in the marching band or any one of our classes really helped that transition from uh, middle school to high school, or if you're transitioning from another high school to our high school, just that involvement can really help. So again, welcome tonight, and um, we'll pass it on to uh, Sarah. Hey everyone, so I teach ceramics. I'm actually gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Um, and I just wanted to show a little bit of some examples of what is made in my class. So I teach ceramics one and two, and the main goal in my classes, um, I think in all the arts classes is growing in your creativity and your self-expression. And in ceramics, we do that three-dimensionally. So we work with clay. Um, ceramics one is mostly hand building. So you're using your hands to build a variety of different sculptures using different hand-built techniques. And then ceramics too is when you get to use the fun wheel, which is that spinny thing where you magically make a bowl in like five minutes, but it actually takes longer than five minutes. Um, so just know that if you're wanting to throw on the wheel, you do need to take ceramics one first. You can't skip to ceramics two. And ceramics one, you'll learn kind of like the foundations of ceramics and then in ceramics too you'll have the opportunity to use the wheel but if you have any questions feel free to let me know I'm excited to hopefully have some of you in class next um, semester or next year uh, and then we'll have Ms. Tesson go next I'll skip back to her slide thanks Sarah um, so in graphic design um, we're becoming better visual communicators. And so what we're trying to do is learn how to take a variety of information and make it more functional um, and also dynamic and interesting. So it's a fun class because we're using uh, software that professionals use. We use Adobe Illustrator and Adobe Photoshop. 
Um, so it's a great way to learn how to make information be informative or educate someone, um, how to influence and persuade. And then the fun part is providing a visual experience. So um, to the right here, you'll see some, these are mostly graphic design one projects. Um, we do character design and product design and page layout. At the bottom is a little bit of Photoshop stuff, um, which you get into in graphic design two and three. Um, and then graphic design four, you get to do um, some more custom projects. So just a little bit of everything. But yeah, we, it's really cool that um, we have a great lab and that we have access to the software. So I think it really provides something that you could use, you know, post high school. It's great to put on your resume, um, especially since the creative community, it's something they're very familiar is working with the software that we'll be working with. And you can take um, graphic design as a ninth grader or a 12th grader. And I've had students take maybe graphic design one in ninth grade, and then they might wait till junior year to take graphic design two. Some people like to take it right in sequence, um, like two in a year. So what's nice about it is you can kind of mix and match if you want to try out some of the other art classes as well. Um, yeah, and then I think Aubrey, you're next to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so there we have a few things. And then Sarah, if you can go to the sequence um, slide just above. So we do have a sequence for you guys. We dropped that in the chat. And so this kind of shows you uh, entry level courses. So that would be graphic design one, art one, ceramics one. And then of course, if you're interested in IB, you just need two sequences that go in order of each other. So that could be ceramics one, ceramics two. It could be art one, art two. Um, but those are kind of your gateway to get to IB. Um, and then we can go to the next slide. Um, so a few things, we do have a website, so feel free to go on there, poke around, you can see stuff about ArtFest and student work. And then we also have an Instagram, so you can see work on there as well. So we just wanted to share that with you. And then on the next slide, there's a little bit about IB. So one thing is that we have SL and HL, and that can get a little confusing, but Essentially, SL is a one-year program, and then uh, HL is two years. So essentially, two years, you get a little bit deeper. You have more time to devote to your studies and really develop being a strong body of work. And my email's on there. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. But really, it's great because students are working um, 2D painting and drawing, they're doing 3D digital installation, really anything you can think of. Um, if you have an interest in it, you get to go for it, which is a lot of fun. Um, if we go to the next slide, there's just a bit info on like what skills you're gaining, what materials. If you notice in the photo that is in here, everyone is doing something different. So there's no one size fits all truly every single person kind of big picture is their own boss. So being really good with advocating for yourself, um, being curious, being okay asking questions is really great. And it's a really fun environment. Um, there's there's kind of no dull moment, which is why I also really love teaching it. Um, on the next slide is for folks who are kind of curious about testing and we can go through the next one as well. So those slides will just give you a visual for the differences if you were to take the art exam. Um, but of course, there's you know a, a Zoom for IB as well. But if you have questions, you can totally ask me about that. And I can't remember if there's another slide after that, but oh yeah, and then we have design stuff. Um, so, but really big picture is Get your foot in the door with art one, ceramics one, graphic design one. I would say art one gives you more uh, diversity and trying different things. And then you get a feel for what you like. And then that helps you kind of funnel into other areas. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out if you have questions. It's, it's a lot of fun. We have a really good community of students, which is great. Great, why don't we jump in to Ellie and then uh, James. Okay, 
Um, I didn't make a fancy slide, but um, <laughs> it was fun looking at those. <laughs> so um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I teach photography in your book and there have already been some questions about your book. I, would, I wanna echo like multiple things that people have mentioned. I think that um, what um, Chris started with at the beginning about students finding a place where they really feel like they can belong and then Greg added on to that. I think that's the experience that we see in the arts is it's not necessarily us. It does relate to what we teach, but it's the community that they find among the other students where they're accepted and welcomed and not judged and they find themselves growing. That makes all the difference um, in them um, caring about and respecting them, their own selves and feeling happy and successful. I also, um, I think that I definitely teach creative um, classes, but I think more important in what I teach is the power of storytelling. I think that what kids grab onto in my classes are that um, storytelling, be it through imagery or words or the combination thereof, um, empowers them to recognize that their voice matters. And so that's like the heart part, right? But then there's also just the really obvious part, which is that our world needs storytelling across. Um, it needs it for understanding each other. It needs it for businesses to run. It needs it for um, social media to actually be successful. Storytelling is really, I feel like perhaps the most timeless skill that there is. If you think about how we know about the history of the world. And um, so that's kind of the key thing that I find students fall in love with. And I find, I also, I always say that I'm maybe the luckiest teacher teaching yearbook because I get to firsthand read all of the stories of our community. And so I have like a love affair with our community because as they say, if you ever actually get to know someone's story for real, then you'll connect with them, you'll love them. And so I get, I have a great advantage because I get to hear so many community stories through the kids that participate in the class that um, it offers me this window into loving like this whole community for like its incredible richness. I would also add on to what Mary said, which is that um, in our digital world, teaching Adobe kids come out with um, resume building hireable skills out of our high school program. So there's also that piece, which is equally important, but in a different realm, perhaps in the brain realm. So um, juniors and seniors can take photography and you can take photo one and photo two in the same year. I had a great question from someone who's coming in as a sophomore. And if you have come from a photography program, counselors will put you into photo as a sophomore um, because you're continuing a program that you've already had. But in general, it's juniors and seniors. Your book can start as sophomores. I would say about half of your book students are seniors because they just finally have enough room in their schedule to do something like that. And the other half keep doing it. If they come as a sophomore, they do it as a sophomore, they do it as a junior and they do it as a senior. If, um, very rarely does a student take your book and not um, continue doing it. So there was also a question about editorial and leadership roles. And generally that students who are returning and um, apply to their peers that they would like to be in an editorial role. And of course, um, if there's more questions at the end, we'll be able to answer them. Thanks. So I guess now it's James. Hey, thanks, Ellie. So I think um, a couple of classes that are sort of a natural entryway for uh, ninth graders into theater is theater one and two, which is usually a blended class of both those levels, and then theater production and design. 
Um, and theater one and theater one and two, I, I'm so, I feel so lucky that I get to teach it and, um, and lucky that I get to teach my subject in, in general. Um, we spend a lot of time building community um, and we play games and, and do ensemble building activities and improvisations and my class or stage is often sort of filled with laughter. And I'm so grateful to, to be able to be a part of that. Um, and even on Zoom, I was, I was you know, relatively terrified when we started teaching classes on Zoom, but I was so sort of pleased and gratified that the kids kind of stepped up and were continuing to try to like, you know, do what we do within this format. So uh, it's been a hard, but a really gratifying year. Um, theater one and two is performance class, um, and the and theater one students are often kids who may have taken theater in, in middle school and had a great time, or maybe they've never taken it at all, and that's totally fine. Theater two are usually kids who've taken it and are really kind of gunning and and maybe have already decided that they love the theater and that's what they want to do. Um, and I try to differentiate in theater two, where theater two students will do additional scene work. They'll also direct theater one students in scenes and do a series of monologues. So they can have a lot of sort of balls in the air at the same time. So I'm trying to keep that a, a rigorous class for them. Um, what else was I gonna say? Oh, and I love just the variety, like piggybacking on what Chris said, just that there are, there are those kids who know they wanna do it right off the bat. And then those kids are great. But then there's also kids who are really shy and they're, and I admire them so much because they're taking that class because they wanna stand up in front of people and try to face that fear. Um, and then there's kids like I'll get a senior or a junior who never got around to taking it and was like, oh, what the heck, I'm a senior, I'm gonna take a theater class. And those students are always delightful. And it's kind of great for freshmen too, because they're in a mixed class right off the bat with ninth through 12th graders. Um, so I think it, I think it helps to sort of bring them up a little bit and it, and the, the juniors and seniors seem to enjoy the, you know, the, the, the playfulness, you know, of the class. Um, theater production and design is sort of the other entry level class. And that's, uh, that, I love that class too. It's a building class. It's usually a support course for our after school productions and as well as we do some disparate projects, but we're, you know, we're learning how to work with, um, with uh, hand and power tools and we're making stuff and really try to emphasize the idea that, um, that they're creators too, that it's, that it's a creative endeavor as well, right? That, um, and the, and the, and there's, there's entryway for a lot of kids from theater production and design to go to our backstage crew for our after school program um, and continue that work at sort of an, a more advanced level. Um, and, the, and I love those kids too. I'm always so impressed with them because you can understand why someone wants to be on stage, you know, in front of the lights and get all the applause that kind of makes sense. But for a kid who just loves the theater, who loves that aspect of storytelling and wants to stand backstage and support and not necessarily get the applause or the attention, it's a pretty beautiful moving thing. Um, from there, I teach uh, IB theater um, super creative course. It's a lot of, you know, sort of creating um, theater pieces, works of art from the, from the beginning of an idea all the way to some sort of realized um, public performance. Um, it's a blended class as well, where it's theater ensemble and IB and theater ensemble, sophomores can enter theater ensemble. And then they sort of serve as the acting company and also do other projects um, along with IB. So they're doing a lot of that same work. And it's kind of a great way for those students who really want to follow the sequence all the way through and are real serious students of theater because they see the IB assessments and program and they get this kind of front row seat into, into how it all works. Um, I also teach IB film, which I've loved. I've taught it for the last couple of years. Um, it's a really fun dynamic in class because we'll watch and analyze films, but then we're also making films. So we're constantly sort of moving back and forth between those two modalities and kind of keeps it lively. Um, I really enjoyed it. And that's all I'm going to say for now. All right. Thanks, James. Hey, um, Greg, I think I saw maybe, I don't know if there's any other questions in there, but I saw one question that we haven't answered yet. And it was, it had to do with marching band. How, um, how can band students get involved in marching band? Yeah. Well, if you are signed up for one of our concert band, either the ninth grade or the uh, symphonic wind ensemble um, in the spring we'll be sending home information regarding um, our summer camp in august 
Um, we also have uh, a Facebook page that uh, um, has a lot of really, really great information. It's uh, under Sunset Apollo Marching Band and Auxiliary. Um, sign up for that. We'll get you information regarding um, summertime and that's how you become involved. Sign up for one of the classes, you're in. Easy, easy. Great, okay. Well, we have uh, about 15 minutes left. We can take any questions. You're welcome to do the scary thing and unmute and let us hear your- You can even turn your video on too, right? Hey, you hey, to. no. I have a question, but yeah. my camera is on a different, yeah. co connected to a different computer, to my work computer. So sorry, I can't turn on the camera and I don't know how to raise my hand in Zoom because we use WebEx at work, but I still have a question. And this is question is about photography. My son is in ninth grade. He wants to go for the full IB diploma. So he's, uh, 11th and 12th grade will be incredibly difficult to schedule and very, very busy, but he loves photography. And, you know, I learned to be super patient when he's sitting in front of the owl, sitting on a tree, waiting until it starts flying. Or I was nearly freezing to death when he was experimenting with astrophotography. And you mentioned uh, that in principle, it is uh, only for 11th and 12th grade, but there are certain ways, uh, like if a child took certain classes, uh, it might, he might be allowed to take photography class, for example, in the 10th grade. Maybe you could elaborate on this a little bit. Uh, is there anything outside of school, like maybe at community college or somewhere else uh, that a student can take during summer to potentially qualify for a photography class in the 10th grade? A good question, Andre. And I think, um, I think in this case, if he's already, um, willing to make sacrifices to take his pictures, then he's already showing an interest. It's a bit of a strange year. And actually, um, Chris Bick will have to answer this question. But I, I believe that he will not be able and same for um, our student who's coming from flex, mm -hmm. will not be able to see photography in that forecasting form. Um, because but um, historically, every year there have been some students who, um, as I said, ha who have given a case to myself and the counselor and the counselor has put them in as sophomores and it's been successful. So I would say it won't be possible for your son to choose it on the form. It will require that they should go to the open office hours with their counselor, um, which are open in 11 to 12 every day, is that right? Um, so. Somebody, I think that all the counselors through next Wednesday have open office hours. And um, if he wanted to send me a small portfolio, you know, perhaps 10 of his photos, mm -hmm. then um, I could be in dialogue with his counselor about approving this. And Chris Bick can, can answer. That would yeah. be my approach. No, you're absolutely right. It's not going to appear on the forecasting sheet. However, um, you know, I think the most graceful approach right now would be like you suggest, Ellie, to have that portfolio come to you. And that can kind of be our frontline assessment. And, you know, we can start a process from there. Um, no promises today, but let's take an honest look. I love yeah. it. Generally, it's been sort of a, a three way dialogue between the counselor, myself, and the applicant um, to see if we can make that happen. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate your flexibility and willingness to help to accommodate students' desires and intentions. If I may ask, and <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I have one more question at this time to Chris Rust. And this is you mentioned uh, music theory. Um, and I think you said something about IB music theory. Uh, did I hear it correctly? Or because it didn't appear on the um, pathway uh, slide, um, it showed IB arts. And I got a little bit intrigued if it is a separate IB program or if it is. Um, uh, a part of IB arts? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So under the IB umbrella, 
we have um, IB Art, IB Theater, IB Film, and then IB Music. Um, so there are four IB routes that uh -huh. fall under the arts. And then IB Music is going to be very, um, there is a performance part of it, uh, as well as, uh, well, I should say performance or composition element of it. And, and then there's, it's very heavy on analysis. So it's very music theory based. So students who are interested in coming into, I, in, into IB Music need to be able to read music, uh, treble and bass clef, and know their key signatures, major and minor scales. That's the pre. Oh, I see. Is it one year or is it a HL class or is it standard level class? It's typically standard level, but I have a mm -hmm. I have had a few students that take it as an HL class where they just take it for two years and the second year is mostly independent study because we don't have enough students that take it as an HL to have a separate class. Um, but students can take it as an HL. It's a it's a it's a very rigorous class. Mm -hmm. So taking it for two years uh, helps spread that out. For sure. I see. So maybe we will contact you also with some more questions Absolutely. about it, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Yeah, my son is in um, OMTA piano program, yeah. so he hopes to complete it by the end of the year. And last year, when there was this talent show, he played Moonlight Sonata. Maybe yeah. you have seen it even. Um, so um, I'm I'm thinking that maybe this is something that he could consider for the IB program as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, the OMTA kids always do well. If they pass piano syllabus 10, they're fine coming in. They they do well in IB Music. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Thank you. Hey, Greg, um, there was a question a while back that was, uh, when will, what about auditions for jazz or funk? Um, if you are auditioning and you're new to our school, or even if you are a current student, send me an email and we'll arrange the time to get that um, taken care of right away. Just send an email. Great. There's no, there's no uh, audition for funk band. Okay. But there is a part audition for jazz lab. Gotcha. Okay. So I, I think you're, you're getting, the, hopefully we're getting the message. We're going to try and answer all the questions, but but we're all very open and you're welcome to just email us because we're a funky department where we all get along and we love each other. We're like, yay, but we're all kind of really our own individual entity. And so, um, so yeah, feel, feel free to contact us individually. Absolutely. So Carol, do you want to, do you want to share your question in person or do you want me to go over it? Yes. Hi everyone. Hello um sorry for my english you know so yes my son would like to take the uh, ib heart you want to do the full ib and doing the the diploma at the end so does he have to choose the the medium from the first year or does he have to explore different uh, medium and decide at the end which one you want to um you know to to take for the for the exam so sure sure i can answer that um and if it's possible i would like to share my screen um chris am i able to do that you're still a co-host so you should be okay great um so there's kind of a i'll try to be short with my answer even though it can be somewhat long um he has a lot of choice there are times when I will instruct them on how to use certain materials. Other times they will choose. The first year is very experimental. I'd say the first two months. And then students are also required to explore um, 3D, digital, 2D. So the first chunk of time is really about exposure and experimenting. Um, this is for the exam, I can skip this one. So you can see some students will realize halfway through the year, um, even the scallop in the top right, she had no fashion design experience. Two months in, got a sewing machine. We were working through some ideas and then all her work became. So students have a lot of freedom to explore the mediums they're working with, but um, in general, 
they are challenged to stretch themselves. And I would say by second year, and this is kind of exam info I'm running through <laughs> really quick. I'm trying to see if I can find another image for you. Um, by the second year, students kind of find their little area that they're really excited about. And with that said, one student might primarily produce five paintings and then they might produce a video piece and then they might produce an installation piece and then they might go back to a painting and then they might create a digital piece and then two more paintings. So it really is about them developing their voice and that can, um, that can span across a lot of different mediums. But I will say that the beginning is a lot of experimenting um, being exposed to different things and then they get a feel for what they're really excited about and then they just go, which is so exciting. So um, I want students to feel encouraged that and even I see like a lot of students worry about, oh my gosh, what if I'm not good enough? And that's not what it's about because every single person has a different skill set. They have a different voice. Um, when you walk around the room, every project is different which is so exciting so he does not he doesn't have to have it figured out yet at all um the biggest thing is as long as he has those prerequisites taken care of he, if he has a level one level two he's good to go and he'll just try a lot of different things and then as time goes on they kind of hone in and focus on what they're really excited about so he's fine. Yeah. Thanks so much, Aubrey. I'm going to yeah. jump in and, and answer Zeta's question because I think it's a really good one. And I think it, it again, it just kind of strikes to like a core belief of mine. And that's that um, I, I have almost never or rarely heard, you know, the seven of us use this term not good in the arts. And, and I just think that's something that we don't see kids that way. We don't see kids as, oh, well, they're good and they're not good. Um, it's all about where are they on their journey. So I think to answer that question, how did they get graded? Um, that's where our different class levels really make a big difference. So I know for me, um, if I have a student, well, if, if their skill level is here, then there's a certain choir that they that would be appropriate for that skill level that will help them get to the next skill level. So if their skill level is here, but the madrigal level requires them to be functioning here, I'm not going to put them in madrigals. And the same could be said for all of the theater classes for yearbook, you know, for ceramics and IB art, you know, I mean, if they're not functioning at the IB level, we can figure that out within the first two weeks of class, within the first two days, usually. Mm -hmm. And and but but that's where kind of the the tiered classes really makes a difference. No one is going to be in ceramics one and not be good enough at art. That's just not how any of us see it. Um, and I would even go so far as to make the statement that if a student is with me for three years and they're not ready for chamber choir for our competition choir, that's that's on me that's not on them that's on me as a teacher so 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 if they want to learn and grow then then bring them to us and then it's our job to help them build those that skill set and we won't put them in a class that we're not going to set them up to fail if that makes sense now where it gets tricky is when students like feel that pressure to take ib that's mm -hmm. where it gets tricky i think sometimes and i have had a few students where i was like you know what, I think you should probably be in regular music theory. You're not, you know, you either got to, you either got to catch up. Here's what you need to do catch up or so that's probably the only time where we would, we would have a conversation with student and parents in terms of grades. Yeah. Cool. Well, did we, did we get all of them? I'm not sure if we did. So Chris, I did have one question about the IB art exam, but I can, hang a little bit after since that's kind of a specific okay you know like not everyone may want to hear the slides and whatnot so yeah. i'm happy to stay a bit after okay i would i would okay and if anybody else has any other questions that pop in go otherwise i'm going to hijack the meeting for, for anyone who doesn't know i'm the department chair 
<laughs> not, so that's why I've been doing most of the talking. I'm not really bossy. I prefer to just sit behind the piano in a company <laughs> life, but uh, that's my role. So I'm, I'm taking it and going for it. I would love to hear just real quickly and, and teachers, I'm going to give you a second to think. I, I would just love to hear what is a current, you know, artistic interest or passion um, of your own. All right. Um, because I think that's so important that we are always pursuing our own arts. And so I know for, um, for me, I'm a, I'm a composer in addition to directing the choir and teaching music theory. And I just most recently in the last like three months started uh, getting back into composing instrumental music. I, I've been composing choral music for my 20 years of teaching, um, but I just got back into writing again for instruments and I really missed it. And that's, that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of a fun passion, artistic passion for me. I would love to hear, I think I'll just let you go however you want to jump in. <laughs> Wait for me to call on you. I saw Mary, I'll, I'll go. Um, I have felt um, a really, um, I've been compelled to participate in the a lot of the BLM marches, especially with the youth across the city in the past nine months. And I've found um, I've found actually that I can serve by documenting that and giving those photos to the, the, the youth who are organizing and participating. So it's been really there's been so many speeches that say find how you can contribute. And so I feel really lucky that my art that I love has has lent itself to being able to contribute to another piece of my life that I feel um, compelled to participate in and be inspired by. Thanks, Ellie. Aubrey, you ready to jump in? You're unmuted. Oh, sure. Like last time when I was muted and I was just going at it. Um, sure. So I'm, I'm primarily a painter drawer. So I got my, uh, BFA in painting and drawing and then, you know, my master's and master's of art and teaching. But, um, I would say I'm a painter by nature and I would, I, looking back, I think I have this like resurgence interest, um, or fascination with flight. When I was in college, I was really curious about birds and flight and migration. And I just, it, I would say in those years was really curious and then it kind of faded off. And then I redeveloped kind of an interest in um, kind of, I would call the underdogs of birds, like geese. No one likes geese. I love geese. I don't know why, you know, things like that. So, and I, and, and the team knows I got pet ducks recently. I mean, really, I, so it's that thing where I'm in the backyard with my ducks, but also um, I'm just really drawn, I guess, to things that don't get that much attention. And I really love that in nature. Um, so I would say, you know, I'm primarily a drawer and painter, but some of my work is circling back to, to those things, I would say. That's, I think, somewhat accurate. You should have had the ducks with you tonight. You know, if it was daytime, I literally could just turn it to a window and you would see them putzing around. It's true. My students know. So if you're going to have me as a teacher, you'll, you'll see them, at least on Zoom, for sure. That's great. That's yeah. great. Did I cut someone off? Nope. Mary, Sarah, you go? go. Oh. Mary, James, Sarah, go. I'll go. I was just thinking <laughs> the last like structured project I did was about a year ago when we started quarantine, I did a daily illustration. And that's when I thought quarantine was gonna be about 30 days. <laughs> so like 75 days later, I was like, I think I'm just gonna stop. So this is taking up a lot of time. Um, so I, I actually did, you know, my personal practice uh, in college was a lot of printmaking and I, what I love about printmaking and ceramics and what I see kind of tying the both together is they're both very process oriented. They're very um, meditative. Like I know painting and drawing is as well, but for me, those like, pro I like organization. I like being, having like a system of things 
And um, so for me, working on ceramics and getting to throw on the wheel has been really great during this time. And I think also for, I mean, students as well, just getting to do something tactile and physical when we're in front of screens so much right now has just been really wonderful. Um, so yeah, I think just kind of, I mean, yeah, I think the last like structured project, like I said, was <laughs> the daily illustration. That was a while ago. And since then I've just kind of done art as like self care <laughs> mm. to, to relax and to just kind of get out of my head and off of a screen. Love it. Love it. That's great. Okay. We got it. We're running out of time because we got to let people go. Do you want to go super quick, James, Greg, Mary? Sure. I, I'll go really fast. I, I'd like to think of myself as a writer, but I'm good at starting and not necessarily finishing. I have half a dozen pieces sort of in the works. And I think the thing that I'm enjoying the most is building stuff, um, woodworking. Um, I, you know, I tore a deck out and built a fence and put in a fire pit and I let, and I invariably screw it up because I'm sort of learning as I go, but that's part of the fun of it is then you have to figure out the problem solving part and walk around and think about it for a couple of days. Like, oh, okay, I'll do this and that'll mm -hmm. fix that bad thing I did. So. I love it. That's great. Greg? Yeah. I, uh, about six months ago, I bought a uh, hybrid horn. It's called the Plumpet. It's a mix. It's a hybrid of a fugal horn and a trumpet. And I've found that uh, I'm doing a lot of transcribing of uh, two of my favorite trumpet players, Freddie Hubbard and another guy by the name of Booker Little. And uh, I love reading um, these great arts related articles sent to me by one of the best administrators I've ever had the pleasure of working with, Mr. Bick, New York Times, yay. Keep them coming, Mr. Bick. Amen. So, yeah, between New York Times and my Flumpet, life is good. That's great. Flumpet, New York Times. All right, Mary, take us out. <laughs> so my background's in design. I was an environmental designer before I started teaching. So um, I always have side projects going on. I love all of the fine arts as far as painting and collaging. Um, I like to do a lot of that and put it into my design work. Um, yeah, and then I just rescheduled an art residency in Greece next summer. So I'm super excited um, about that. <laughs> That's so exciting. That is wow. the best way to end. I love it. <laughs> Everybody, thanks so much for coming. If you have any questions that didn't get answered or you want to hear about Aubrey, continue on about the IB art slides. Feel free to stay. Um, but thank you so much. We look forward to working with you and your kids. Pretty lucky. We have pretty good jobs. We do, we do like our jobs. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Cool. Good night, everybody. And if anybody, do you want to do you want to just jump in, Aubrey? Yeah, sure. Let me get my share my screen. Okay. Okay, so I will definitely try to make this as quick as I can. You know, so really with the IB exam, this chart shows you what HL students would complete versus SL. And um, these rubrics are fairly small, but the best way for me to describe is that students create an exhibition, so a body of work. They document their process with a really long slideshow that includes research, reflective writing, and then they do a really heavy duty art history research project that also involves um, a lot of analytical skills. So I'll, I'll skip the rubrics because you know you, you can always go and read them on your own time. But um, with the exhibition, the students over either the SL one year time frame and SL requires less amount of works. They do have less time, so it is tricky, but they're creating a body of work where there has been intensive research. Um, and these are just a few examples. So along and you can tell the difference so when we're at school students have a studio space last year some of the testers they set up their artwork at home so that they could complete the exam so they're doing individual pieces along with the full body of work students write a curatorial rationale it's a fancy word for an artist statement about their exhibition so then they're walking they're essentially verbally walking the person through their body of work 
They then write up descriptions and that is submitted to the web, the IB site. Normally when they have an exhibition on school, like at the school on site, we would print these out. They would put them up with the works. Um, but of course there's a lot of organization involved. Um, process portfolio. This is one example of one slide and I did put links here. So you can always go in and click on a link and see an entire example of a student's work, but they're showing their research, things are cited, they explain how they did things, when they did it. Um, and really with the process portfolio, they're covering uh, brainstorming research, problem solving, risk taking, their process and then reflection and critique. So these are those are the big bullet points. And then the comparative study, you can see here there's multiple slides. They're picking three artworks and they're researching them, analyzing them, um, sharing how it influenced their own work. And then I do have a video. This is actually a video. I won't play it on Zoom because of the, the sound, but Definitely, you can click on that on your own time. There's a little video that explains the comparative study. That is 20% of their test, even though I will say it is a lot of work and it's a lot of time. So their exhibition and the process portfolio, those are 40%. Um, and here, sorry, I'm bumping around. Um, this is the exhibition. You can see here that HL requires more pieces versus SL. However, the tricky part with SL is students start in the fall. They have four to five months and then bam, the exam is there. So I always encourage students, if you do have the opportunity to go HL, do it because you're gonna have experimentation, developing your work, you have a summer, then you have a whole year to really um, dig deep. And then these are comparison screens for process portfolio and comparative study was that art history bit I mentioned. So um, there is, you know, of course, if you're in the course longer, you know, there, there are more slides. However, um, comparative study is pretty similar versus HL, they do have three slides where they write intensively on how those artists influence their work. So that's kind of a real quick run through. Really, the biggest thing is that students are creating complete original work that is heavily researched. Um, there's, it's really great because I learn a lot from my students because in their process portfolio, students will share why they're making things, how they did it, um, their concepts. So the exam is, I would say, certainly different for SL and HL, but we all know with the IB diploma, everyone has different needs. So we just make sure students get what they need. And then um, the key with that, with IB art really is just being willing to work incredibly hard. Um, it's a lot of hours. I would say each of those little squares on that chart is probably, um 10 to 15 hours of work so if you do the math it's a lot of it's a lot of time but the joy of that is that students are choosing artists that they're interested in they're making work they're passionate about and they are the experts about it because it's their work um so it requires a lot of intensity but it's it's also a lot of fun and i'm happy to answer any specific questions you have um about it because i went fairly quick it's just kind of a lot <laughs> when i think when i look at it it's easy to have kind of your eyes glaze over a little bit um but i think that's kind of the basic rundown cool thanks so much aubrey does any yeah. anybody want to ask a question before we close the door also you can always email Aubrey, just, mm -hmm. you know, let's flood her, her email box. <laughs> you like the ding, 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 ding. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay. Um, I see one question. If you choose IB or SL, do you need to take the exam right after that semester? So the exam, all the exam content is uploaded in April. So if students have me in September, 
and we're doing a little bit of experimenting right at the beginning. It's like you have kind of October, November, December, January, February, March. So yeah, it's, it kind of plays out at about five to six months. You are making all of that work ahead of time and then you submit it in April. And, so, and so, probably, should probably add IB art is a full year. So it's not just even just at the semester. Right, yeah, it's a full year course. So um, yeah, with SL, it's one year. They have me the whole year. If they choose to take the exam, that there's the exam, all, you know, that content is submitted in April. And then we always have really fun projects afterwards. So they're still engaged in having fun. Um, if someone takes HL, they have a full year with me. And then kind of toward the end of that second year, they submit their work. Great. Have you ever had a student take IBSL 11th grade, but then test in 12th, 12th, 12th grade, even though they weren't your student? Um, I have not. I have had juniors BSL and they took the exam as a junior. I think that if they had to, they could. Um, I do think taking, there's a lot of follow-up and it is pretty demanding. So um, unless there's, there was something urgent that then came up, I almost want to encourage them to test their senior year because there's, you know, that amount of time there would be kind of a disconnect. So I have had a student take it um, junior year and I, as a whole, I think that if they're like, that's what I can fit in my schedule. That's the only thing I can do. Um, I certainly have had students that have done really well. So it's like, yes, it's totally doable. If they have the option, I think HL provides like way more beneficial time to develop that body of work. Um, so yeah, the exam as a whole for SL and HL it's uh, April. I think our deadline this year is like April 19th or something like that. Is it, is it fair to say, because at least this is how it is in music, the work, the, the quality of work is actually very similar between SL and HL. The amount of work is a little bit more in HL, but when you break it down by the amount of work per month, mm -hmm. SL is actually way more. <laughs> Yeah, I would say the SL is actually much more demanding because when you think about it, students in the class, they have to figure out their style, their voice, their state. I mean, it's like boot camp, essentially. And what happens is I have a bunch of HL1 students. I have SL1 students. They're all doing the same stuff first year. And then, you know, when SL kids finish, then those HL2 students produce more um, more work. But yeah, I would say that SL um, is tougher than HL. Like I'll just come right out and say it, it is, <laughs> you know? Um, but truly there are some students that say, you know what, this is what works best for me. This is what I can fit in my schedule. And we just say, we're gonna try to make this a great experience for you. Yes, you have to work hard, but um, I've had some students that, you know, like I had one student actually moved from Poland and she wanted to do SL and she had prerequisites and she worked so hard and she passed the exam and she did great. So it's really about the work ethic, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I can take this, this uh, question. It was about IB art because it's going to be the same for music and for theater. And that's... Mm -hmm. um, Sunset doesn't dictate who signs up for the art exam. The student and their family decides. So mm -hmm. what do you know what your percentage of testing kids is? How many kids, like if you have a class of 30, how many test? Sure, I would say, well, let's see. So um, first half of the year I had 67 students total. And then this quarter I have 24 and then Total from all those kids, I have 10 testers. Okay, so it's only one in nine. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where it comes down to the families have to do the homework of which colleges are you looking at? Will they accept, will they accept uh, credit? 
what what, mm -hmm. what do you get out of paying your whatever $150 and taking the right. Time? Yeah. And I always encourage students, you know, I have a handful of students that they, they may not be doing the diploma, but they really want to take the exam. And I say, here's the thing that you have to be really honest about what you want out of it. If you, you know, if it's the score, then, then yes, we'll be really strategic about you getting that score. If you're really concerned with, well, I want to go to art school because a lot of private art schools, they won't take IB credit. It doesn't, they're like, nope, but you develop that really strong body of work. And that body of work is what's going to get you the money for your scholarships. So you really have to figure out, am I doing this because I want to create this body of work? Do, am I just really passionate about it? And I want that challenge. Um, do I want to go to a state school and get a passing score so I can get some elective credit? So it's very um, like individualized and personal as to why you're taking the exam because that's just so different for every every kid. Um, but I think that 